Hello, everyone. Uh, this afternoon, we'll be talking about oversight of, of clinical laboratory testing and some of the uh, issues that uh, are facing us as we grapple with how to do this in the best possible way. I'm Karen Call, and I'm chair of pathology at North Shore, a uh, multi-hospital system in North Suburban Chicago. And I'll be introducing some of these topics and focusing on the background, the history primarily of uh, lab developed procedures in molecular pathology and sort of why we're talking about this today. So thank you for joining us. So as we look back over the last three decades, uh, we can see the importance of CLIA oversight in clinical molecular testing and all areas of the laboratory. Clinical molecular testing started in the late 1980s as an outgrowth of activities going on in a, a small number of laboratories across the country when we began to envision how we could use this information to improve patient care. So around 1987 or 88, laboratories began to actually transition to more clinical activities. And about this time, we uh, were issued the five original methods-based CPT codes for reimbursement, and that really launched this area of molecular pathology uh, into the beginning of what we, we see today. Now, again, these were methods-based um, CPT codes that allowed us to describe what we we're doing in the laboratory. Uh, I've listed them here, nucleic acid isolation, digestion, et cetera. And we use these codes to describe what we were doing in the laboratory, no matter what the assay was. Now, at that time, we had very few tests. Uh, the initial tests included things like T and B cell gene rearrangements, of course, by southern blotting, uh, BCR ABLE, linkage analysis for genetics. Uh, a number of labs were looking at um, uh, cystic fibrosis uh, inheritance, for example. Uh, some used RIFLIP analysis, and there were a few laboratories also doing primarily qualitative detection for various microbes, such as um, cytomegalovirus. And we had precious few methods at our fingertips to uh, employ at that time. Again, it was largely radioactive southern blotting, uh, Sanger se sequencing, again, radioactive in nature, restriction endonucleases, gels, dot blots. Uh, the important uh, take home here is that there were no kits in this era and that the laboratories were faced at that time as developing best practices and standard procedures uh, to perform these tests with the thought in mind, uh, even then, as we started on this um, pathway that we needed to ensure the patients were getting the right answers and that the testing was being performed and generated the right answers in all laboratories doing that testing. So there was very much a quality mindset in those very early days. But the take home is that all of these uh, were done by lab developed procedures or lab developed tests. Uh, note that these terms are sometimes used interchangeably. Uh, I think many of us prefer lab developed procedures because it encompasses the entirety of the testing procedure uh, that we're utilizing in the molecular or other uh, clinical laboratory. So as we look back historically over the last 30 years, uh, lab developed procedures generally precede the development of clinical assays and kits. Uh, again, some of these arose from uh, individual laboratories, research or clinical translational projects uh, when they found their way into uh, utilization for improvement of patient care. Some great examples here would be T and B cell gene rearrangements that we all started doing around 1990, uh, herpes simplex virus, PCR for encephalitis, uh, where we could begin to get a rapid answer and avoid a brain biopsy. Uh, you know, these are all uh, assays that arose out of, of clinical laboratories preceding a kit, um, but ultimately kits became available based upon the tremendous amount of information and, and clinical studies that were published by laboratories doing this work, and, and the list goes on and on there. Lab developed tests or procedures can uh, be a bit more nimble if one is trying to quickly fill a, a clinical need. I think many of us in the field uh, can readily remember 2007 when our um, oncology colleagues came back from uh, their ASCO meeting, suddenly all needing KRAS mutation analysis uh, because of some groundbreaking um, work that had been published that, at that time and, and the need to know in order to treat patients appropriately uh, with uh, lung cancer uh, therapies. There were no kits available at that time, so laboratories got together, exchanged information, methods, samples, et cetera, and very quickly within a few months brought up a testing network 
across the country that was providing quality level testing for KRAS at that time. Um, a few years later, we did have kits available, but uh, you know this functioned quite adequately and at a high quality for a number of years. You know, many other examples, particularly in um, next generation sequencing or in the somatic characterization of tumors. Uh, BRAF, for example, uh, is important in a number of tumors and a growing number of tumors. And what we often find is that when a company achieves uh, FDA approval for an assay, it's often linked to a single sample type or a single tumor type. And it puts the laboratories in a difficult situation because we may be needing to test that identical mutation across a, a variety of different tumors. Um, if we're gonna do this, we, we really can't afford to bring up separate assays and instrumentation. So what we end up uh, being placed in the position is um, having to revalidate uh, this kit, uh, if we're using a kit across a spectrum of different uh, materials. A lot of work for the labs and it essentially turns this kit into a, um, a lab developed procedure. So, so a lot of practical things in laboratories that um, have supported the use of lab developed procedures for many, many years. Now kits do have their place and they uh, make it easier to offer a test broadly. And in particular, I'm thinking about the large number of microbial kits that are in use across the country. And basically these do standardize the uh, performance or the procedures um, being used for a particular analyte uh, and allow that analyte to be tested in a variety of laboratories, including those that are not as sophisticated as the uh, traditional molecular diagnostics labs. Um, you know, many, many uh, routine hospital laboratories are now testing for a variety of molecular, um, a variety of microbes uh, using molecular assays, and that's been made quite feasible by these kits. So there, there is a wonderful place for kits, um, but also a place for lab developed procedures. So just a bit of definition here, a lab developed procedure is an optimized laboratory procedure. It's not a kit. Uh, it's developed in a single laboratory. It's not distributed or shared with other laboratories. And it's meant to function at the highest level of quality for that laboratory. And our quality control is really dictated to us by CLIA, which is the Clinical Laboratories Improvement Amendments. Um, these are, of course, federal regulations that uh, dictate the oversight of clinical laboratory testing. They were originally published in, in 67 and revised in 1988 um, and really uh, outline for us how we are to function uh, in the clinical laboratory. Now, there are several organizations that CMS has uh, given authority to enforce CLIA to, one of which is the College of American Pathologists also New York State Department of Health. And I, I'd say those two organizations are, for most clinical laboratories, the, um, the uh, body that oversees the laboratory and also provides trained laboratory personnel to do external inspections and so forth. So that's where most of us go for our, our CLIA oversight. There's a variety of other uh, resources in the field, uh, including consensus guidelines, are written by CLSI that dictate how to set up tests, what the assay performances would be, and, and a growing number of consensus guidelines from professional societies, again, that give us um, a sense of how our assays should be performing before we put them into clinical use. I think an important part of CLIA is that the performance um, of a individual laboratory lab developed procedures compared to that of other laboratories via ongoing proficiency testing. And we, again, need to check this to make sure that we're always turning out the right answer and an answer that's in agreement um, with that of other laboratories. So this is something that we do for both uh, lab developed procedures as well as kits. And it's, uh, again, dictated under CLIA. Uh, for background here, CLIA is uh, administered by CMS and there's a lot of information available online. Uh, one can actually go straight to CMS for certification, but I think, most uh, clinical hospital and um, network laboratories, again, are, are working with CAP or their state public health department, their state uh, department of health. Now, referring mostly to how we deal with CAP, but also CLIA, um, you know, it's important to think about what goes on in hospital laboratories. Uh, most laboratory testing is not molecular. Uh, hospital and system laboratories are uh, highly, um, regulated and staffed by highly trained technologists. 
specialized equipment and materials. Uh, it's not a, a routine situation where people who don't know what they're doing are, are doing the work. So there's a lot of oversight of these facilities. They're doing molecular testing and other hospital clinical testing. Most laboratory testing in general does not use a kit. Um, think about what happens in hospital laboratories, uh, surgical pathology, reviewing biopsies, um, microbiology where we're culturing uh, microorganisms, the blood bank, for example. These are all procedural areas that, that may employ a kit for a small portion of, of a procedure, but in general, this is a process, not a kit. And I'd say that that concept is an important one to keep in mind because it really encompasses all of what we do in a, a, a clinical laboratory. Oftentimes kits are not available. Uh, we see this again and again as, as new methods uh, become important in patient care and uh, we may need to offer that method prior to the establishment of a commercially available kit. And it's also important to keep in mind that kits don't encompass the full testing process. Uh, in the laboratories, we're looking at the full spectrum of the process, including pre-analytic, post-analytic steps. And these all must be monitored to ensure that we're turning out a quality result for patients. So the kit is not the entirety of the process, it's just a small part of it. The important thing about CLIA, from my perspective, is that it does cover the entire process uh, and uh, will ask uh, specific questions and require us to collect data and information on the pre- and post-analytical issues, it sets out uh, who can uh, work in the laboratories, what sort of competency and training they require. It goes into great detail about how we validate the uh, procedures and the assays that we use in the laboratory. And it also dictates um, how we do the reporting and much, much more. So um, it, it's really encompassing the whole spectrum of activities in a clinical laboratory. And it's important also to keep in mind the CLIA oversight of the use of an FDA approved kit is still important. Um, you know, CLIA requires that we examine, again, the entire process, um, including proficiency testing, external inspections, et cetera, even if we're using an FDA approved kit to uh, examine and analyze. So a quick glimpse here at um, the molecular pathology checklist. Again, I mentioned that CAP is the uh, authority for many of us in clinical laboratories for the oversight of CLIA. Um, the molecular pathology checklist is one of uh, scores of checklists that, that um, have been developed through a consensus process by experts uh, by the college. And uh, the molecular checklist uh, is, I believe, 86 pages of tremendous detail. I don't know if you can actually see the, um, the uh, index here on the side, but it, it goes into tremendous detail about each and every aspect of how we do our testing. And again, um, external inspectors come in every couple of years to check on our data, make sure we're doing it appropriately. And we all do participate in proficiency testing, either through the college or other organizations to make sure that the answers that we are generating are always correct and uh, in alignment with other laboratories. Uh, I mentioned that validation of assays is delineated in detail uh, in this document. Uh, and we go through a tremendous amount of work up front before launching an assay clinically to define sensitivity, specificity, limit of detection, accuracy, reproducibility. We examine interfering substances. We look at uh, different um, sample types and matrices uh, for analysis. Um, tremendous amount of work here for a laboratory doing a laboratory developed procedure, but it's important for us to do this to make sure that we know all of the details uh, about that assay. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at you know, sequences and primers and probes, et cetera. We really need to understand how our assays function before we launch them for clinical purposes. Uh, we also spend a lot of time looking at, at uh, you know, sample uh, consistency, sample stability, and the post-analytic process of, of reporting those results to make sure that um, our results are as accurate and understandable as process. So the end goal of CLIA for lab developed procedures is quality and accuracy of the end result. And everything that we do is focusing on that. So just to compare and contrast uh, uh, the uh, oversight of laboratory testing under CLIA administered by CMS and that of the FDA. Uh, currently, CLIA oversees all of it, um, but in particular uh, raises the bar in terms of the data we collect on laboratory developed tests or procedures. 
um, which again are tests that are not marketed, not used externally, but are procedures developed and performed within a single laboratory. And CLIA uh, oversees the entirety of the procedure performance, not just the analytical kit that we might be looking at. The FDA uh, procedure in uh, contrast looks at in vitro diagnostics, which are the testing kits. These are boxed and shipped um, and sold across state lines for a variety of laboratories to employ. From the laboratory standpoint, these are really black boxes. We don't know what's in them. We often do not know what the primer sequences are. And, and just to um, uh, use as an example, uh, you know, some of the recent uh, activities we've had related to COVID testing as we're seeing um, variants and, and mutants, you know, we want to be able to go back and take a look at the sequences under the primers and probes for those to make sure that the assays are not losing the ability to detect all variants of that virus. Um, we can't necessarily do that because we don't know the, the sequence used by the kit. Uh, so again, it's a black box. We can't really manipulate that or understand what's going on under the hood. And the FDA um, procedure uh, addresses only that kit performance. It doesn't look at what goes on before or after the kit that might influence the um, performance of that assay result, uh, things such as fixation and sample stability and so forth. So it's really looking at just a small portion of the procedure. The last thought here uh, that I wanted to touch on is the fact that um, the corporate development of kits uh, taking place in our, in our system here uh, requires that manufacturers be able to recover the cost of the FDA approval process, the clinical trials and so forth uh, by the manufacturer. They're making a investment in developing these assays and they need to be certain that they're going to recover that expense uh, on the back end after receiving FDA approval. And as a result of that, uh, kits generally target the very large market assays, things where they know there's going to be uh, enough uh, market to support the investment they've made. Uh, analytes might include many of the molecular microbial uh, assays, HPV, chlamydia, HIV, and so forth. And some of the more rare or less common assays, even though they're extremely important clinically, um, are not developed by the companies because there's just not enough market share to uh, support the investment they'd be making. You know, we did HSV PCR for 20 years using lab developed tests um, and finally do have a, uh, a kit so more laboratories can perform this. But there, you know, that's an example where there just simply wasn't enough um, utility, uh, even though it's extremely critical clinically uh, for a, a manufacturer to invest in the development of that kit. Uh, new FDA approvals. Uh, rarely are, are sought as new clinical needs arise for an assay that's already in the market. And what this requires uh, the laboratories to do is to revalidate that assay for different tumor types or different sample types um, so that they can you know, answer the clinical needs of the clinicians and patients they're serving. Uh, but it really turns those kits into a lab developed procedure, uh, adds expense and effort on the side of the laboratory, but it, it's unusual for uh, a company to go back and, and seek new FDA approvals if um, you know, the clinical situation has changed um, for patient care. And again, changes in panels are very difficult to incorporate, and this is something that we deal with as well. Uh, if a you know, new mutation, somatic mutation in a tumor becomes important because of changing therapy landscapes, um, you know, it's unusual for a company to go back and incorporate that. Now with next gen, um, it becomes a bit more easy, but uh, in the past when we've had, um, you know, specific mutation panels, it's been very difficult to alter those, again, because of the expense and the uh, energy that's gone into seeking FDA approval for that panel. So it's a very rigid and expensive system, um, which uh, further supports, you know, the need to have some flexibility and the ability to do, you know, high quality lab developed procedural testing under CLIA.